Hello. Hi, I'm Sally Bradshaw. Welcome on this rainy night. Uh, we're delighted to have you guys with us. I hope everybody can hear me okay. I am I'm so sorry that we had to do this by Zoom instead of in person. Mother Nature is not only, I think, a theme of Virginia's book, but it's also a theme of tonight's event. And so we hope everybody's safe and comfortable at home with a cup of coffee or an adult beverage. We're delighted to be with you guys. Um, and on behalf of Midtown Reader, I wanna welcome you uh, and also welcome our author. If you have questions as we get towards sort of the last quarter of the event, um, please put them in the Q&A and I'll monitor those and make sure Virginia has those. I'll have a few to kick us off. And um, this will be available, this recording, for you to share later. We'll post it on the Midtown Reader website. And so you can share it with all of your friends. So welcome, welcome. Um, Virginia, we're delighted to have you to talk about your debut novel, The Marsh Queen, which was published this fall. Virginia, as many of you know, holds an MFA from American University and teaches creative writing at my alma mater, George Washington University, go Colonels. Um, in Washington, D.C., and she also teaches at the Writers' Center in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, her fiction, poetry, essays have appeared in multiple publications, and she is also a co-editor with Barbara Estman of A More Perfect Union, Poems, and Stories About the Modern Wedding. So we'll have to carry that at Midtown Reader as well. That will be fun. Her work has been nominated for a Pushcart, a very prestigious prize, and her writing has been supported by the Swanee Writers Conference and the Virginia Center for Creative Arts. Her stories have also been shortlisted for the New Letters Prize, the Tennessee Williams Festival Prize, and the Dana Awards. Uh, so it is really a privilege to have you tonight. And again, I'm sorry that we're not together in person. Virginia's going to talk about her book, and she's going to actually read some from the book, I hope, but I did want to give you a sense of the terrific praise um, the Marsh Queen has garnered from multiple um, writing establishments and organizations. Uh, Shelf Awareness says the novel's framing details of Florida's marshland, ornithology, museum work, and fine art are expertly and beautifully drawn. The Marsh Queen is unwavering in its lush, finely detailed, appreciative portrayal of a distinctive natural setting and ends on a redemptive, even inspirational note. That is high praise from Shelf Awareness. Kirkus says that this debut novel set in rural Florida definitely combines family drama and a tense thriller. Publishers Weekly says this is a well-crafted and fast-paced drama. Uh, so we are excited to hear all about it, hear about the background, Virginia, uh, why it was written, how it was written, all the details you can give us. Um, thank you. Thank you for being with us. And I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Well, I certainly appreciate it, Sally. And I just want to say thank you for having me. It's really an honor. And I, I think Midtown Reader is such a fantastic uh, resource in the community. And um, I just... I'm pleased to be here. Um, I have a few comments about the book, um, and then I will read a short section from, um, from chapter three, which is pretty self-explanatory, um, but uh, my little introduction will help you understand. So I'm just kind of dropping you into chapter three without chapter one and two. Um, so uh, The Marsh Queen is about a young bird artist, Lonnie Murrow. She's 36 and she works in Washington, DC for the Smithsonian Institution, um, their Natural History Museum. And um, she would rather draw birds than do just about anything else. Definitely, she'd rather do that than come back to her hometown um, in North Florida. Uh, because there's some trauma there. Her father died when she was about 12, um, died in the swamp. And while it was ruled an accident, there have always been some questions that she would like to just put in a box and put away and not think about. And when she comes home, she's faced with them sometimes. And so she tends to stay away. Um, but her mother needs her and uh, she takes some family leave from her job so she can come down and help her mom. Um, and while she's here, um, her time keeps getting extended. And she, um, she has a little bit of tension with her mother, Ruth, a little bit of tension with her brother, Phil and his wife, Tammy. Um, but she takes 
kind of solace by going canoeing out in the swamp and drawing birds out there because that's where she learned to love birds from her dad. Um, and uh, so while she's here, she keeps getting hints from people everywhere she turns about what might have killed her dad. Um, so the book has a lot of opposites. It has like big town versus small town, natural uh, Florida versus a more tamed environment, uh, being independent versus being in relationship and having compromise with people, um, wanting not to know something and yet learning just about enough that she feels like she has to pursue uh, and find out something. Um, trying to run away versus turning and facing something difficult or unpleasant. And anyway, those opposites can create conflict and questions, but especially a lot of dramatic tension, we hope. Um, the passages that I'm gonna read tonight, I'm gonna read a little snippet just about Tallahassee. Um, and then, um, and then, kind of a more dramatic part from chapter three. So um, let me just start with the passage. It's just very short, very is going to, uh, here, I want to get to it. Um, she's going into Tallahassee, which is about an hour's drive from where she lives by the swamp or where her parent, her mom lives. And, you know, she's taking care of things there. Um, so she says, I love the road leading to Tallahassee. First, because it leads to Tallahassee. Second, because it runs right through an oasis of unspoiled Florida landscape the Apalachicola National Forest. It has two narrow lanes with slash pines on either side growing straight and skinny with branches that start about 17 feet up. My windows are open and the sun flash flashes between the trees. Back when I left home for college, this road represented the wider world. At Florida State, I discovered who I could be when my mother wasn't around to click her tongue. Back then I was running away. Today, I'm running toward. So I feel like I have run toward Tallahassee today. And, and it's a good thing. Um, and then the, the, the other part that I'm going to read is um, when she is just leaving Washington to come down here. And uh, there's a, the dates are important because there's a little bit of a ticking clock going on in the book. So this is March 17th. Revelers in green stumbled from pub to pub as I drove away yesterday from springtime in Washington, a collage of the organic and the man-made, red bud and sidewalk, dogwood and car. Small trees in the easement showed feathery pink blossoms. I've left the delicacy of spring for a hot, sodden green, the cruise control carrying me through south, through Virginia and my hometown of Tenetki, where the water transitions slowly into land. I pull into town and a droplet of the old familiar wish to be anywhere else diffuses through my rib cage. I roll down the windows. The air is heavy with moisture, the wind redolent with rain. I stop for one of only six traffic lights in Tenetki and rummage in the cup holder for a covered rubber band to pull my hair off my sticky neck. At the third stoplight, I pull into the parking lot of St. Agnes Home, or as we kids used to call it, the Geezer Palace. I wish it really were a palace for my mother's sake. The building has a Victorian facade, gingerbread cheerful with a concrete ramp leading to sliding glass doors. I sit in the parking lot and watch the automatic doors open as someone approaches, then close after the visitor passes through. I check myself in the rear view, combing out my hair and dabbing some makeup over my freckles. 
I rarely wear foundation, but I'd like to avoid advice from my mother about fixing myself up. Little good it does, the makeup just forms beige colored beads of sweat that I wipe away with the tissue. <clears throat> At least my eyes look okay. The whites clearly defined against the green irises. I thought they'd be bloodshot given all the hours I've been driving. I sit for a few more minutes staring at the outside of the building. Because mom broke her wrist, she went into St. Agnes for physical and occupational therapy. Phil hinted on the phone at the possibility of a permanent move. I was skeptical, but he reported a level of chaos in the house I could hardly believe of my fastidious mother. Open food containers in the linen closet and soiled clothes stuffed into bureau drawers, burners left on, midnight rambles through neighbors' yards, and an insistence on driving after several costly collisions. Last year when I was here for a few days, none of this was evident. But I suppose while mom's wrist heals and she recovers in the geezer palace, Phil and I can figure it all out. When I arrive at her room, she's sitting in a vinyl chair, her arm in a cast and a sling. She starts in right away, the aging debutante with a voice full of mint juleps and brass nails. All right, now Lonnie, take me home. No, hello, darling, it's been a long time. How good to see you, no kisses or tears. Hi, mom, long time no see. Don't switch the darn subject. You're here to take me home, now let's go. Phil's wife, Tammy, who's a beautician, has styled my mom's hair into two stiffly sprayed soup can sized curls, ascending an inch above her center part, the gray tips curving down and touching her temples. Without any intention, my sister-in-law has given my mother the look of the boreal owl, Ageolus funereus. If, as Tammy claims, she tailors each of her hairstyles to the personality of the client, what might this one indicate? Wisdom? Insomnia? The hunter's instinct? My mother stands. I've got my purse now, let's go. I search the room for a distraction. Hey, look, Tammy hung up your wedding picture. Yes, my mother says, and when I tell daddy how you have incarcerated me here, he's gonna whoop your hide. It takes my breath for a second, dad spoken of and in the present tense. She's not only mixed up the years, she's trampled the unwritten family rule. Nobody talks about daddy. And whoop your hide, that would be his phrase, not hers. She opens the bathroom door with a good arm. I'm fixing my hair and then we're going. She shuts the door harder than necessary. Her open suitcase on the bed looks like it's been stirred with a wooden spoon. She's been packing to go home, but I reverse the process, hanging a blouse in the Spartan closet, then folding and arranging the other items back into dresser drawers. I'm about to close the empty suitcase and put it under the bed when I see a piece of pink paper in the elastic side pocket and pull it out. Dear Ruth, there are some things I have to tell you about Boyd's death. Boyd, our father, who aren't in heaven. My eye darts to the signature, Henrietta. I reread the first line then scan the flowery penmanship. Rumors flew around, I couldn't tell you then. My mother opens the bathroom door and I slip the letter into the back pocket of my jeans, nudging her suitcase under the bed with my foot. Not a Q-tip in this whole establishment, she says. Hey, I can go get you some. I'm out the door before she can fuss anymore about going home. The Tenetki Pharmacy is only three blocks from the Geezer Palace by sidewalk, a block and a half if I cut through the park, and I can read the letter on the way. And then she runs into an old friend of her father's. So she forgets to, to read the letter. And she's kind of in a dark mood when she comes back because he has called up a lot of memories about her father. Um, so she, she gets the Q-tip, she comes back. And I'll start there again. I reach the geezer palace and hold out the Q-tips to my mother. Lonnie. I'm glad to see you. Listen, I'm congested. She exaggerates a breath, not a glance at the Q-tips. Hear that? Phlegm. Next time you and daddy go to the swamp, tell them to bring me some bayberry leaves. I don't want a whole tree, just a handful. Got to inhale the vapors. What, does she have ESP? 
I'm thinking about him, so she has to think about him. For her, he's just out doing his swamp time, which would make me what, 10 or 11? I yank us both back to reality. Mom, I got your Q-tips. And what about our rule? Don't mention daddy. She should follow the rules. My mother says, nothing like that Bayberry when you're congested. The folksy wise woman thing isn't exactly an act. She learned about herbal cures from dad's mom, Grammy May, but it wasn't inborn. At 16, my mother made her debut in Tallahassee with the white gloves, the big dress, and a daddy dance at the cotillion. Both her parents were professors at FSU, her dad in zoology and her mom in classics. And they were grooming Ruth to be a concert pianist. All that ended when she married my father. Grandmother Lorna would finish teaching a class called Philosophical Approaches in Ancient Greece and drive down the hour down to our place in Tenetki to say things like, Ruth, just, before, just because you married boy doesn't mean you have to turn into him. But my mom adapted to her rural surroundings, picking up more from her mother-in-law about herbs and country gardening than she ever learned from her own mother about the cultivation of roses. In her tiny room at St. A's now, she says, so tell your daddy about the Bayberry, won't you? She sinks into the vinyl chair. He never comes to see me anymore. Yeah, well, he never comes to see me anymore either in good riddance. But I take the thought back quick. It wasn't good riddance. It was stupid, unnecessary riddance that took the ground from beneath our feet. Mom, I have to go. I'll be back tomorrow. I kiss her cheek, soft and cool. She's definitely not feeling well or she wouldn't allow it. Panic blooms on her face. You mean I'm supposed to sleep here? Part of me wants to whisk her out of this room the size of a galley kitchen and back to the house on the marsh with the sleeping porch, the Florida room and the unattached garage smelling of mulch and clay pots. Yeah, I say, yeah, I say. You sleep here, just until your wrist heals. A possible lie. I turn to go. She says, what's that sticking out of your pocket? I put my hand to the back of my jeans. The letter, I forgot to read it. Oh yeah, my uh, shopping list. Lie number two. See you tomorrow. This time, as the sliding door is shut behind me, I reach back and unfold the pink paper. Dear Ruth, there are some things I have to tell you about Boyd's death. Rumors flew around and I suspect they hurt you. I couldn't tell you then, but now it's time. If you don't mind, I'll stop over in a day or two so we can talk. Yours, Henrietta. Henrietta, I try to put a face to that name, but I can't. I refold the note and step down the ramp and into the parking lot. A man with wispy white hair and uneven gray stubble approaches me, moving faster than his age would suggest. Shouldn't he be inside? He calls out my last name. Hey, Murrah! He's suddenly up in my face. You better look out or you'll be floating face down in the swamp like your daddy. I inhale. The man snarls like an animal. Get out of town, girl. A young guy in purple scrubs comes around the corner of the building, flicking a cigarette butt. Hey, Nelson, he barks. You are not allowed on the premises. How many times do we have to tell you? Move along. The old man jumps back and away from me. He heads across the parking lot and toward the street. But then the wispy head turns and his roomy eyes catch mine. Do I know him? He climbs into a battered blue pickup, peels out, and he's gone. <laughs> that's fantastic and I have to tell you you're a great reader of your work you know oh, thank some, you. Some, some authors are not uh are, are not great readers of their work yeah. <laughs> but yeah. you put a lot of expression in that that's enjoyable oh, thank um, you thanks so let me ask you something Virginia you have called this in other conversations you've had uh on your tour and in other interviews a very swampy book <laughs> Um, I assume literally and figuratively. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by that? 
Well, you know, I mean, the setting, of course, is she is in the swamp all the time uh, in this book. She she loves to canoe and she's out there and she has this love hate relationship with the water because of course it's the water that took her dad away from her. It's also the water that she learned to canoe from him. They went out together. Um, he taught her about the birds and that has led to her lifetime of, of loving birds and drawing birds and noticing. Um, and it's also, there's a lot of murkiness about her past that, um, you know, how did her dad die? Um, what, you know, did he, did he love her as much as he seemed to? Was he who he thought, who she thought he was? Um, so I think the swamp in literature and in our kind of collective consciousness is a, is a mysterious place is a place um, that some people avoid. It's a dangerous place. There are a lot of critters there that can hurt you. And we see a lot of them in this book. <laughs> um, but it's, it's also psychologically, you know, we talk about being in the swamp of despond, you know, and the, and, and uh, we, I think, I think we think of a swamp as a place that, can kind of catch you if you're not careful. Just a reminder to um, the group that is with us, and we have a large number of attendees tonight, uh, you can put questions for Virginia into the Q&A and I'll get to those in a minute. Uh, but I just wanted you to know all you have to do is click on Q&A and I'll monitor those for her. Uh, you told an interesting story, just continuing on the swamp theme for a minute. When you were giving an interview at Politics and Prose, a wonderful bookstore in your hometown of DC um, about specifically a swamp story you have from Louisiana. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, when I was in my 20s, I, I, I drove across country and um, I think I was driving to Florida because my real hometown is West Palm Beach. So I, I was born and raised in Florida. So I think I was driving from LA um, on the West Coast to uh, West Palm and and stopped in Louisiana and had um, a swamp tour near Slidell and um, and this fellow who gave us the swamp tour was uh, he knew everything he knew everything about the birds and um, and everything about the leaf of every tree I mean he was so knowledgeable and then um, when uh, when we were leaving he you know he dropped us off you know we had kind of had our little tour and um, and at the dock was his daughter who was little. And he picked his daughter up and they went off in the boat. And I just remember that image so clearly of this kind of seasoned swamp guy and this little girl's innocent, you know, and you could tell just from the way they interacted that they had a really close bond. And that was something that like, I didn't know I kept with me so long, but when this book started coming into, you know, fruition, when I started coming up with characters and story, um, that image really came back to me. And um, so it's funny how things kind of stay with you for a long time and you don't know they're going to go into a story until they get into the story. To a big book. Um, so, so to that point, how much of you are in that little girl or how much of you are in Lonnie in your main character? Uh, where are you similar to Lonnie and where are you different from her? That's funny. That's a, well, it's funny because someone asked me that question at the first reading that I had for this book. And I said, well, if you want to know what we have in common, She's a badass. <laughs> and, and I kind of love that. That's aspirational for me. I don't know if I'm a badass or not, but I, I love that she starts out as kind of, you know, drawing birds, you know, that's a quiet profession. And yet she has to really summon a lot of courage throughout this book in many ways. And um, so that's something that I aspire to. So I think novelists get to get to live in their characters 
the people that they want to be. Um, so I would say I put myself aspirationally into that aspect of her. I do love to canoe and I love the birds. I'm a huge bird nerd. Um, and I think that's, that's what started this whole journey was my love for the birds. Um, so I wanted to get the details right. Um, and she is a noticer, you know, a novelist has to be a noticer and I needed a character who would notice things very in, in detail. And an artist has to do that in a visual sense. Whereas the novelist is making word pictures that you hope are as accurate as, as you know, an artist would paint them. So we have things in common. I wouldn't say that my upbringing was her upbringing or that any of the relationships are my relationships, but sure you put yourself you put all your memories into something. You put a lot of emotion into something. And, and so these little threads come out that, you know, you find our- I, I think she has your sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> you have great humor uh, in this story at all the right moments. So one of our attendees, we have several questions from attendees and I'm going to get to those, is that you go into great detail on birds and on vegetation. And there's obviously, I mean, you obviously know some of this, you've done a tremendous amount of research. Can you talk about how you know this amount of information on, on birds and vegetation and how much research you had to do for the book? Yeah, well, I, um, I count, you know, like I have a certain amount of writing time that I do every day and I count lying on my couch reading books about birds and herbs and things like that. So, so uh, I do love to do the research. Um, one real great experience I had was a backstage tour at the Smithsonian where they were so welcoming to me and let me talk to a bird artist and another natural history artist who kind of invited me into her studio and showed me her materials and showed me what she was working on. Um, and there are just a lot of bird skins which is what they draw from um, in the Natural History Museum. And it was fascinating. It was completely fascinating. Um, but so that was really hands-on research. Um, and I like, you know, I, I just, the more you dig into a subject, the more there is to know. So I get very granular in my research and um, especially, the herbs, I, I mean, Ruth, her mother is an herbalist, you know, whose, whose garden is prodigious and she makes tisans out of the, the herbs for various uh, ailments and so on. And that was fascinating because that is her story, right? That is women's history. You know, women have been trusted throughout the ages, um, even before they were trusted to read um, with herbal knowledge. And so that was really fun research um, and to find all the lore that goes along with the herbs. Um, that was fun. So I, I would say I love doing the research. Uh, so that's what helps me learn and learn enough so that I can inhabit somebody who has that knowledge from day one, whereas I've just learned it because I wanted to dig into it a little bit. That's interesting. Aline asked, why North Florida? What's the inspiration for you for North Florida? And you and I talked a little bit about this before we started the webinar tonight. Can you talk about that for yeah, everybody? Else? That's, that's a good question. Yeah, because I'm from South Florida and um, I, I love the whole state and I have traveled the state. I mean, when I'm one of five kids, so when, when my parents wanted to take a vacation, we just drove and we went to Wikiwachi and we went to Silver Springs and we went to, uh, you know, um, all those places that were really kind of old Florida attractions, um, Cypress Gardens, you know. Um, but as an adult, I've discovered a and see the most wild parts of, you know, the mangroves and, and everything that inhabits that, that habitat. Um, West Palm is getting a little bit more uh, 
civilized and um, and more populous. Uh, so uh, so some of the habitat is disappearing. It, there are still pockets of it, but I, I needed a place where someone could live right by the swamp, and that's that's possible in not in Tallahassee proper, but in the environs. A lot of um, a lot of uh, the action takes place in Wakulla County, um, which is south of Tallahassee. So that's why I chose this area. And I love this area. So do we. <laughs> <laughs> Someone wants to know what your biggest challenge was in writing a novel um, and getting it to publication. Uh, and I, that's a particularly interesting question, I think, because you are a creative writing teacher. So I think those of us who are not writers, who are just readers would think, oh, this isn't challenging at all. She teaches creative writing. But what were the challenges you faced? And then how did you get it to not just publication, but publication with a major publisher? Luck. <laughs> I, I do credit luck, um, but persistence is also important. Um, Michael Chabin has a quote, and I'll probably butcher it, but he says, um, there, are, there are several things that you need to become a successful writer. Um, one, is, one is luck, one is talent, and one is persistence, and two of them you can't control at all. <laughs> you know, but you can control persistence. And um, so I think that's true. You have, I mean, there's always gonna be rejection uh, when you're sending out material and a lot of people did not want this book um, or this manuscript and um, you just have to kind of put on your bulletproof vest and say okay well I'll send it to somebody else and maybe they'll want it and 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 the lucky part is you know it crossed the desk of somebody who was amazing Jackie Cantor and um, she connected it was it was the kind of book that she wanted to publish. And so she accepted the book for Simon and & Schuster and Gallery Press, um, which is a, an imprint of, of, of Simon & Schuster. And, and uh, she was very invested in this story. And um, so that part was definitely luck. And I'm a little, I'm a little, like I'm not, some people say, oh, you can't teach writing. I don't believe that. And I don't think that like talent, you know, that's kind of a vague term. I think you can work toward, um, toward becoming a better writer. And, and that also has to do with persistence. I mean, it's a practice, right? I have to write every day. Um, and I think that I've gotten better over the years. So maybe, you know, some of the things that I, submitted to magazines or whatever when I was younger didn't you know weren't as good because I hadn't had as much practice so um so I think persistence is really important um but there's there is a lot of luck unfortunately um one question that um and I don't even know if she's on because I haven't looked at the full list but we have uh, a, a midtown reader who's been with us a long time and she always asks Authors, are you a plotter or are you a pantser? Do you outline or you just go for it? What's your approach? And when do you write? Do you carve out time every day, once a week? Is it the same time every day? What does that look like? Okay, I'll, I'll answer the two parts of the question. The, the first one is I just wrote an article for the Writer Center magazine. The Writer Center is this wonderful um, community asset and resource in, uh, in Bethesda, Maryland, um, where you can take a workshop, you can go to, they have online, you know, uh, craft chats and they have online classes as well as in-person classes. And I do teach a workshop there. Um, and they have a magazine that they put out that has a lot of uh, their information in it, but they, they asked me for an article and that's exactly what I talked about, the plotter versus the pantser. And um, I want so badly to become a platter. <laughs> I haven't been so far. This book was not planned or outlined. The book that I'm writing now was not outlined. And, and I think I would save myself so much work if I outlined. I talked for the article, I talked to a writer I know named Art Taylor, who's, who 
is, is also a teacher in the area um, at George Mason University. And he said he's a planter because <laughs> he, he makes an outline, but he allows himself to deviate from it if something bubbles up that's great. And, and I think that's kind of what I want to adopt. You know, I want to be a better planner so I don't have so much work organizing all my material at the tail end. Um, because that's time consuming. Um, but I think you have to allow yourself that flexibility. And the second part of the question is, um, yes, I do write every day. I like to have two hours a day, but I have to have a minimum of an hour a day. And I write in the morning because in the morning, like my judgy head is not on yet. You know, I'm not saying, oh, this isn't any good. I just, I just do my work. Before, I'm, I'm kind of half asleep, frankly. Um, and um, I do, I write as soon as I wake up and my husband kind of gets mad at me because I say, don't talk to me yet. So don't turn on the radio, please yet. <laughs> um, I, I kind of kind of go into a little, you know, cave and, uh, and do my writing. And I find that works best for me. I know a lot of people are great night writers and that's fine, but that's just what works for me. So titles, as a bookseller, the one thing I've learned as a relatively new bookseller is that titles and covers really sell books. The cover of your book is beautiful. The title is wonderful. How much input did the publisher give you on the title? Did you start with this title or was that something no, that evolved no. in multiple conversations? My original title was Drawing Water. That's what That was my working title. And that works on several level, levels because, you know, you she's drawing and she's drawing the water. She's, uh, you know, she draws water as she pulls the boat um, with the oars, with the paddles. And, um, and then there's the whole woman at the well drawing water, blah, blah, blah. But, um, but Jackie was, was pretty adamant that I get come up with another title because it just, she said, it makes sense, but it doesn't draw you in. You know, it makes sense once you've read it, but it doesn't tease you with what might be in there. And so, um, so together we came up with the Marsh Queen and I do think it's a better title. And it also reflects the folk tale that, you know, that, that kind of drives the, the, the whole theme of, you know, the, the tension between the living and the dead, because there's, there's the folk tale about this fairy queen that you know can cross over, can 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 take a message to someone who's passed, and you know that really that really pulls at Lonnie because she wants she wants that message so so badly um, to be able to you know wishfully hope that she could get something across to her father after he's gone. Uh, so. It, that that title really worked for me, and um, as a bookseller, you can you can tell me what you think. But um, it will be terrific to hand sell. We can't wait. I should remind everybody too that, or tell everybody that um, uh, we do have signed copies, thanks to you, of the book in Midtown Reader. We have more on the way, so don't hesitate to call us or drop by the store or send us an email at info at midtownreader.com and we'll reserve your copy of the book. But we look very much forward to continuing to sell it through the holidays. It will be a great gift book. To the, to the point about sort of what the Marsh Queen evokes, um, one of the participants tonight says, this is a very visual book, but of course there's not one picture in the whole <laughs> book. Um, how do you really uh, write descriptions of birds and people and places and make them so real? Is that just something that is sort of your superpower or is it something you really had to work at? I'm glad that that comes across. I'm, I'm really glad that, that, that it comes across because it is important to me, right? She is a visual artist. So it's really important that, that people see what she can see. And, um, and it, it makes me very happy when people say, I, could see those birds, you know, um, even if, you know, I, I didn't know what it was before. I, I can see the birds. I, I feel like I'm in the swamp. I feel like I'm, I'm in the canoe and, and I'm feeling the water beneath me. Um, I, what I always say to my students is you want the reader 
to live in the body of your character. And the, and what, how do we do that? Like, how do you get into the body of the character is through their senses, right? So I, you know, I, I'm always emphasizing, what does that smell like? To, you know, just write a scene and tell me what everything on the table smells like. Close your eyes and write that and separate it out. You know, when you're, when you're learning, I think it's useful to say, okay, now we're just gonna close our eyes and think about what we're hearing. Then we have to open our eyes to write it. But, um, you know, you kind of have to awaken your senses to everything around you. And I think that's really important for writers and for, for aspiring writers, you know, because we forget a lot of our senses. We, we write what we see often, but we don't write the, the other sense, senses. And when you start exploring all the sensory details, even the visuals become more crisp and more clear because you realize the kind of granular detail you need for it to really kind of blossom on the page and for the reader to be able to completely lose themselves in the story, really submerge into that dream of the story. Someone, um, one of the, the attendees tonight asked how you encourage young people who are interested in creative writing to pursue it. I mean, you're obviously teaching young people creative writing, but I don't know that all your students are going to pursue writing creatively. They may be oh. in, you know, very studying in very different areas. If you see a student who you can tell just might have that spark, how, what do you do to encourage them to pursue it? Well, I say take more classes, you know, because um, I, usually in my class, they're getting a taste of it. You know, it's really hard to fit everything into 16 weeks. Once we get rolling, and once people have permission and give themselves permission to just explore. I mean, people come into a creative writing class sometimes and say, I'm not creative, you know, and you want to go just wait, just wait. And, and then when we do certain, certain exercises and certain techniques and, and um, just like, I, I have them free write, which means they are not allowed to let their pen leave the page and they are not allowed to judge what they write. And they just have to, you know, it could be uh, whatever they want, they can write. Um, so once they do a few uh, of these exercises and realize that like, oh, okay, well, I guess I'm writing that because it's important to me and maybe I'll just explore it a little further. Um, I think they, they give themselves permission. Um, but when I do see true talent, I think, yeah, you got to keep doing this and you need to have like 15 minutes a day that you set aside for writing. And then maybe that 15 minutes grows um, because obviously if someone is to starting to get tuned into this is what it is. And this is how I make language work for me. You do want to encourage that. That's gotta be exciting when you run across a student like that, that you know has no. potential. It is exciting. And usually it has nothing to do with me. It's just there already. Well, I'm not sure that's, <laughs> you, you have a lot of humility in addition to a lot of humor in your writing. <laughs> Um, so one of, one of our uh, attendees, we're getting lots of questions, great questions, ask uh, if you, Jenny says, did you feel you had the story inside you that you just had to get out? You just had to get it on paper. Yes. I think that's, that, that is the only reason to write. Um, and you don't always know what the story is, but I usually start with like, a, it's almost like, um, an oyster with a grid of sand, you know, something's bothering me. And I, something's really bothering me. I don't know what it is. And I write around it. And I write until I kind of, I mean, I, I only write fiction. I don't write, I don't write memoir. And I know some people can get to that in a, in a, in a memoir and do a beautiful job. For me, I have to kind of sidestep it. So I, this something's bothering me but I'm gonna put it on somebody else. I'm gonna put it on a character who's not like me. Um, maybe shares some of my annoyances or shares some of my traits, but somebody who's a little different and, and I can get at it sideways. 
um, I can put that person in a room with someone that I'm mad at, <laughs> you know, and, and I can, I can have them have the fight that I don't want to have with that person. So for me, it usually starts with some sort of conflict. And John Leroux, who's another writer, just passed a couple of years ago, um, has this saying, only trouble is interesting in fiction. And I love that because it's so true. You have to have, you have to kind of start with the conflict. So you put a lot of credit in your um, in the reviews that people gave you for this book for the pace at which your story moves, travels. Uh -huh. um, it doesn't get bogged down. I mean, it is, which is the kind of story I think readers like to read. They want it to keep moving. And I saw in an interview that you did that you talked about shorter chapters and to the uh -huh. importance of shorter chapters, why that helps with pacing. Can you talk about that a little? Yeah, no, I, I am, I am really a, a, a connoisseur of short chapters in the, in the books that I read. I like short chapters and I think they're really important. And I think each chapter kind of has to end with a punctuation point. And then also with a little bit of a, wait, 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 what, what's, what's going to happen next, right? So that um, you, you think, okay, I'm reading this right before bedtime and I'm going to, I'm going to set it down when I reach the end of the chapter. And then you go, maybe just one more. <laughs> um, so I do think that's important. And I also think because there's a mystery element to this book, um, one of my writing colleagues, you know, who I, sh I show my manuscripts to um, said to me, I want to see, I, you know, I showed a kind of a nascent version of the, of the manuscript to him. And he said, I want to see, in every chapter, either a clue or a red herring. And I said, you're right, you are right. Because if you're missing that, then the reader doesn't know why, why to move on. You know, what is the story question? And even when it's not a mystery, I think that's important to keep that story question there. Like that's, you know, there's a little something that's unanswered that needs to be answered. And that keeps the, the, the interest of the reader. Back to your point on tension, you know, the anticipation of what is coming next makes a, mm -hmm. a difference, I think. So what are you, are you working on another book right now? I am, it's great. very different. It's not a Lonnie story. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, not a it's sequel. <laughs> no, um, it's um, a love story set against, um, it's set in 2003. And kind of the, the, what's happening in the world is the lead up to the U.S. invasion of Iraq. So I have six characters, um, three of whom are stateside and protesting the war, three of whom are soldiers. And, um, and well, I have, I have more than six. I, I have some others on campus who are kind of, you know, in favor of the policy of going into Iraq. So I, I try to balance it. You know, I mean, I'm, I work with a lot of opposites and I think that that always helps because that does create dramatic tension. So I don't like to have like anything weighted one way or another. I, I want to have that tension. I want to have kind of, you know, equal balance. Um, but it's taught me a lot, this, this book. And there were so many times when I, um, I was gonna abandon the story um, partly because I'm not a soldier and I, you know, I, I feel like I, I'm not sure I can speak to that with authority. And yet, um, I did do a lot of research. I talked to a lot of military people. I talked to people who had been in Iraq and, um, and so we'll see, it's not finished yet. Um, and I still need to do work on it, but I feel like I'm, I've got, I've got it in a shape that I want. What drew you to that storyline? What's oh what gosh? Well, I have to say it again. You know, developed organically, which means that I, then I had a bunch of a big collage of pieces of things that I had to then organize. Um, but this friend of mine, um, who was in my MFA program and also lives in my neighborhood. 
um, and his dear friend uh, wanted to kind of make a pact. So we would egg each other on and, and work on separate projects, but kind of parallel play. And she read a book um, and that's that about an artist who started a new canvas every day. And she said, I'd like to do that with writing. So every day for a little over 365 days, we wrote, she and I, a hundred words a day. It could be anything, it could be a dream, it could be a complaint, a rant, it could be, it, it, it could be a memory, 100 words a day. And it, it seems like nothing, right? That's like two paragraphs. But, um, and then we would call each other or meet and read to each other what we had read and not judge it, maybe say, oh, that's a rich image or you know something like that. But um, it was the most intensely creative year I think I have ever spent because we were accountable to each other. And, and so things developed that we didn't know were going to develop. She was working on a novel that she had already begun and it's hopefully it will come out soon. It, it is a wonderful novel. Um, Sarah Sorkin, she's, she's a wonderful writer. And, um, and I wasn't working on anything in particular. Um, I had set this book aside. I, it was like, you know, the Marsh Queen. I had worked on it and I had set it aside. And so I was like, oh, okay, I'll just, I'll just write down my dream. I'll just write down this or that. And things started bubbling up and I had these characters. And um, so it's, it's a work in progress, uh, but it's, it's kind of amazing what you can do when you're not really trying. So funny, I'm thinking of David Kirby, who's a wonderful poet and on the FSU yes. creative writing staff. He and his wife, Barbara, you may know them. And I remember him once saying to me, be careful what you say to me. It might end up in one of my poems. <laughs> you just <sighs> never know, you know, what's going to end up where. Well, this is this has been a joy talking to you. I mean, I'm just we have a huge turnout. There are several people who have emailed me and said not to give their name. Uh, but to send you a note afterwards, they know you and they okay. want to say hello. So I will follow up on that. A reminder okay. that we have the Marsh Queen at Midtown Reader available. We have autographed copies and we'd love for everyone to stop by. And uh, Virginia, you're headed to Neptune Beach tomorrow. I think yes. for an event. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Appreciate your support of independent bookstores. I know you've made many stops and locally owned bookstores and we're grateful to you and just wish you continued success with the Marsh Queen and uh, look forward to your next book. Thank you, Sally. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. Thank you for coming, coming virtually. Yes. <laughs> Travel safe tomorrow. And thanks to everyone. Oh, there's one other quick question. And since we're not quite at eight o'clock, let me, if I can. Oh, no. Somebody just said great discussion. So they enjoyed our conversation. I enjoyed our conversation and we're grateful to you. So travel safe and we will okay. see you again soon. Okay. Bye. Yeah, Bye. Bye. Everyone.